In this video, we are going to use integral calculus to derive the moment of inertia for a thin hoop or a particle. This is the easiest uh, moment of inertia that you'll be asked to derive an equation for on the AP test. So you'll either have a hoop, so I don't know, like a hula hoop or something like that that's incredibly thin, or you're going to have some particle of mass that's moving in a circular path. Now, in each of these cases, you have only one radius, or mass is only at one radius. Now, in the case of the ball, we've kind of talked about this before, you only have mass at this particular radius, um, and then for the hoop, you basically take all of this little bit of mass, and then you sum it up around the entire hoop. Our equation for the moment of inertia derivation is summa r squared dm. So effectively what we're doing in this situation is there's only mass at one radius, so the radius can come out because it's constant, and then we are adding up all of the little bits of mass. When you add up all the little bits of mass, you're just going to get the total mass. Though we normally arrange this as mr squared. On the AP test, if you just write these two things and don't really worry about those middle steps, you will quickly get the points for this derivation. Alright, so for this video we're going to use integral calculus to derive the moment of inertia for a thin rod of uniform mass. Um, now before we start talking about that, let's first talk about density, because that's going to be kind of important for us. Remember that density is just mass divided by volume. Um, for this problem, when you have a thin rod, what that means is that the width of the rod is so small that you can actually treat the volume of this rod as if it was just a line, just a length. Uh, normally, if you were using the volume of a rectangle, you would do you know width times the length or height times the length. But in this case, you're just using the length. Um, so when we talk about the density, we say that it is the mass, which I'll use m to represent, divided by l, which is the total length of the rod. Because this is kind of a weird thing, um, we refer to it as the linear mass density, and we use the symbol lambda to represent it. So that symbol is lambda. It's like half a stick figure. Um, now, the equation that we're going to use, which is given to you on the AP test to derive moments of inertia, looks like this. Uh, and because they use the variable r for position, um, we're actually going to use r when we talk about lambda uh, for integral calculus. Uh, so, so here's how that works. Instead of talking about the mass density, the linear mass density as the total mass divided by the total length, we're going to talk about how because the mass is uniform, you can say that a little tiny bit of mass, which you could call dm, at a little tiny width, which I'm actually going to use dr to represent because r is our variable for position in our equation. Um, that ratio is the same throughout the entire rod. So you could also say the mass density is the ratio of dm to dr. Now the clever thing about doing this is that you can now replace dm with lambda dr. Now that's super smart because lambda it's uniform, right? The, the density is uniform. So you can actually pull it out because it's constant and then you just have the integral of r squared dr, which is really easy. It's just going to be uh, lambda times one-third r cubed. Uh, and we'll need to evaluate that, right, from something to some other thing. Um, but for the most part, we can simplify this a little bit. Write it as lambda over three r cubed. And all we need to do to successfully evaluate and therefore derive the moment of inertia is understand, all right, well, what's our lower bound and what's our upper bound? Then you plug that into r cubed and you're good to go. So there are two types of uh, derivations the AP test asks you to do. One is to derive the moment of inertia about the center of mass. So what that means is you take your rod and you think about it rotating around its center of mass. If it's rotating about its center of mass, then the center of mass represents zero for us. And when we talk about mass on the left side, we need to say that that is negative L over 2. And we talk about mass on the right side, we need to say that that's positive L over 2, right? Because L just represents the length of the rod, 
um, and you're either half of a length to the left or half of a length to the right. So that's what we use for our evaluation of our integral. We would say negative L over 2 times positive L over 2. Now I'm going to obviously go through and do this, but pause the video for a second and see if you can evaluate this to get the correct answer. Oh wow, you're so smart. Let's see if you did it right. Okay, so lambda over 3, and I'm going to plug in negative L over 2. I'm sorry, positive L. Whew, almost forgot the fundamental theorem. Minus negative L over, dear lord. Okay, 2 and cube. Great. So inside of these parentheses, you are going to get L cubed over 8. Now because this is a negative L and you're cubing it um, and then you're subtracting it, it ends up being minus negative L cubed or plus L cubed over 8. And those combine to just become, you know, 2L cubed over 8. Or if you prefer, you can just say that that's L cubed over 4. All right, we're almost done. There's still another simplification that we need to do. Um, the first thing that I'm going to do is combine the 3 and the 4, right? So I'll, I'll do this over here. Lambda L cubed over 12. Uh, but now I need to substitute back in lambda somehow, because usually you will not be allowed to have lambda in your answer. It might tell you what the answer is, and you're supposed to justify it. So here, here's how we do that. Lambda is equal to the total mass divided by the total length. Before we used the ratio of the infinitely small, you know, mass and position, but now we're using the total mass and the total position or the length. So that's actually what we're going to plug back into lambda. We're going to plug in mass over L for lambda. So that gives us M L cubed over L 12, and one of the L's cancels out. And what we're left with is M L squared over 12. Or you could write that as 1 12th ML squared. Okay, so that's for the thin rod about its center of mass. The other way that you'll ask, be asked to derive the moment of inertia for a thin rod is not about its center of mass. Um, so its center of mass is like you throw it up in the air and it rotates around the center of mass. But instead you might have something like, uh, let's say, the hand of a clock, where the rod or the stick, it rotates about one of its ends. So I'm going to get rid of all this. And let's talk about what to do if the rotation uh, is about the end of the rod. Okay, so in this case, what changes is that you are going to say the end of the rod is 0, and the opposite end of the rod is L. Now, for your integration, you do the same thing, lambda over 3 r cubed, right? That's the integral that we got. And I need to evaluate that from 0 to L, which is a great, a great evaluation. See if you can do it. You did it. Oh my gosh, it's so great. Congratulations. I'm so happy. Okay, so lambda over 3 times L cubed minus 0. Oh, don't you love when it's 0? It's just so great. Awesome. And then I'm going to plug in for lambda the total mass over the total length and get M L cubed over L3. Get rid of that so that it becomes a square, and you are going to get M L squared over 3, right? Which you could write as 1 third M L squared. Great. That's how you use integral calculus. That's the phrase they'll use on the AP test to tell you to do this, um, to derive the moment of inertia for a thin rod of uniform mass. Congratulations. So in this video, we have a solid cylinder, um, we're going to say that it's uniform, is rotating around its center, just like this. You are asked to find the moment of inertia, which you will use the equation given to you on the test right here. Now, in order to use this equation, we have to uh, replace dm with something else. So this should be a clue that you need to look at the density of the object. The density of the object, since it's three-dimensional, we use rho to represent it. It's going to be the total mass, which I'll call m, divided by the total volume, which I'll call V. And I use capital letters to represent that that's the total mass and the total volume. 
Now, because this is a uniform cylinder, the ratio of mass to volume at every point on the cylinder, all these little points, is always going to be the same number. So you could also write that rho is equal to dm over dv. Now, in order to say what dv is, the volume of the object, um, we would need to say that the volume is going to be pi r squared times L. Because basically you're, you're going to take the radius of this object, uh, you know, find the area of a circle and then multiply that by the length, we'll call that L, of the cylinder. Okay, so to, two, to find dv, all you need to do is take the derivative of this volume with respect to position, or the radius, which is going to give you 2 pi r times L. And you can write this, right, multiply both sides by dr, you can write this to get an equation for dv. Which, this is, you know, a little bit crazy, but effectively what we want to do is we want to replace dm right here. So dm is equal to rho times dv, which is actually going to be rho times 2 pi r l dr. Wow. So all of that, that whole thing, is going to go inside of our integral. So summa r squared times rho 2 pi r l dr. Now let's pull anything out that's constant like rho since it's a uniform cylinder uh, and 2 pi and l and we'll combine the r's inside of the integral r cubed dr. Okay, great. Now what we need to do is integrate from one thing to another. So what we're going to integrate from is the smallest radius, or the center, where you have a radius of 0, all the way out to the outer edge, where we're going to call that outer edge capital R for the total radius, or the outermost radius. So 0 to capital R. All right, so when you do that, all of this stays constant. Rho 2 pi L. Uh, and you're going to get 1 fourth r to the 4, and you evaluate that from 0 to capital R, which is going to be, I guess I can bring the fourth out here, right? bring out the 4, so that becomes, instead of 2 over 4, you can just call that over 2. Uh, so r to the 4th minus, oh yes, 0, I love when that happens, 0. So we can just get rid of that whole thing right there. All right, the last step is for us to replace rho, which is the mass over the total volume, with a definite equation. Um, now the total mass stays the same, but we can actually replace the total volume v here with our equation for the volume. But instead of using a lowercase r, which is kind of a variable, we're going to use the uppercase r, because the volume's total depends on the you know, the actual radius, so pi capital R squared times L. Alright, now we plug this into our equation, and we will get m pi L R to the fourth over pi R squared L. And hopefully you see some things canceling. Pi goes away, the length doesn't matter, and the r squared cancels out the fourth, so that what you're left with is m r, I'm sorry, there's a two down here still, two, one half m r squared. So that's the moment of inertia for a solid cylinder. Now, sometimes you will ask to be do this for a hollow cylinder. If you have a hollow cylinder, then essentially what happens is you do this exact same process, only right here, instead of integrating from 0 to r, what you're going to do is you're going to integrate from some inner radius to some outer radius. So let's get rid of all this, and let's show that. Let's show a hole. Actually, you know what? Let's start fresh on a new page. There we go, that's better. So here's a new page. You have a, a hollow cylinder, basically it's like a, a toilet paper roll, um, and it's rotating the same way, and we're using the same method of integration, only now instead of going from 0 to R, we have to go from some inner radius, which we'll call R1, to some outer radius, which we'll call R2. Now that actually also affects our total volume that we use for rho, 
where the mass is the same, you can call it m, but instead of just saying pi r squared uh, times l for the volume, you, you actually need to say that the volume is going to be pi r1 squared times l minus pi r2, I'm sorry, pi r2 squared times l minus pi r1 squared times l, because it's like you're taking the bigger cylinder and subtracting the hollow cylinder out of it. Since pi and l are shared though, we can just go ahead and call that pi times l, r2 squared minus r1 squared, and then that's what we're going to put in for the volume in row. We would have pi l r2 squared minus r1 squared. Okay great. okay, great. We'll use that in a second. Um, the other thing that changes is we are not integrating from 0 to r. We're integrating from r1 to r2. So rho 2 pi l stays the same. And then when you integrate, you get 1 over 4 times r to the fourth. And evaluate that from r1 to r2. Uh, and I can go ahead and combine the 1 fourth and the 2. So you get 2 over 4. And then basically you just make that a one half. And when you evaluate r to the fourth from r1 to r2, rho pi l over two, you are going to get r2 to the fourth minus r1 to the fourth. So this one is not as pretty. It's actually kind of awful and ugly. Um, I'm going to plug in rho before we do a little trick that makes this easier. Let's plug in rho. So we get m pi l over 2 pi l r2 squared minus r1 squared. Okay, so that's everything on the left side. And now I have to deal with this r2 to the 4th minus r1 to the 4th. If you remember from your math class, you can write this as the difference of squares, except the squares are going to be squared. It's kind of a weird thing. This is equal to r2 squared minus r1 squared times r2 squared plus r1 squared. If you're not quite sure of that being the difference of squares, pause the video and prove to yourself that those two things are equal. All right, now I can write this all multiplied by r2 squared minus r1 squared times r2 squared plus r1 squared, and voila! I can cancel that whole term. I can also cancel pi and l, and what I'm left with is a very similar equation. 1 half m times r2 squared plus r1 squared. So that is the moment of inertia for a hollow cylinder. You are so very smart. Congratulations. Normally you use this for a problem called the toilet paper problem where you hold on to the end of a toilet paper roll and you drop it. Uh, you have already done some stuff with that, and we'll do some more in the future with toilet paper. It's hilarious. I love it so much. Congratulations. You are great at physics.